sorry about that. I had to turn my cell phone off. Liz said so. Uh, as Liz said, I'm a historian, and my family goes way back in Lake Minnetonka area. And as a professional historian, Lake Minnetonka history was a natural avocational pursuit. Um, in looking over Lake Minnetonka's history, there was no real good history of the boats. There was this uh, record of old boats that was printed in 1933. It's kind of thin. It's somewhat okay, but not very accurate. And in order to understand Lake Minnetonka history, you really have to have a good feel for the boats of Lake Minnetonka because that was what uh, people came here for, was to enjoy the water of Lake Minnetonka. And that was the impetus for writing the book, the, A Directory of Old Boats. And the book is uh, uh, enumerated all the steamboats of Lake Minnetonka, sailboats through 1899, and motorboats through 1909. And uh, it compiles over 600 different boats, over 300 different uh, images of the boats inside. Uh, if you want a copy, I have them for sale for the, uh, and everything goes to the Excelsior Lake Minnetonka Historical Society, and they're $35 each. Uh, the, this is the, an image from the cover of my book and shows the Lake Park Hotel in Tonka Bay, uh, the steamer Hattie May, a sailboat and rowboat, uh, just kind of uh, illustrates, you know, the boat, different types of boats that were on the lake. In 1856, this is one of the very first maps of Lake Minnetonka and shows the, the lake in its natural environs. And you can see there's just one location where the upper lake is connected to the lower lake, and that would be Hull's Narrows. If we look at the very early boating in Lake Minnetonka, this is a map of uh, YZ, uh, V 1854, and then it hand drawn our images from about uh, 1860. And you can see there's a blacksmith shop, a couple hotels, a store. Uh, you can see the, the steam sawmill on the far right. And then right in here, you can see a steamer, the Governor Ramsey. But you also see half-day boats. By 1860, they were already renting boats on Lake Minnetonka and did just little sailboats. If you want to see what they look like, this is Excelsior. And this is the fleet that they had in Excelsior. Well, a fleet, well, <laughs> it's no armada. Uh, you, can, you can see in the foreground what appears to be a birch bark canoe, which is rather curious because there are no birch trees in Lake Minnetonka. But there's rowboats, and there's the, the cat yawl, which is the, the official term for that type of boat, a sailboat. Uh, two-masted, some people would call it schooner rigged. But that was the White Swan. And this was uh, a charter boat. This is what carried people to and from the various points on Lake Minnetonka for a fee. This was their ferry service on Lake Minnetonka. It was built in the 1850s, and in 1857, it was in November of 1857, it was carrying a new family, new settlers, to their, their homestead on Lake Minnetonka and a storm arose. And they decided to, to head to shore and wait out the storm. Well, the storm broke and it was midnight and for some reason the father decided, it's time to get moving, we gotta get to our home. And uh, it cleared up, but then as they got going, the storm picked up again and the boat capsized and there were eight people on the boat. Uh, five family members and three young men that were riding with them. And the whole family slipped beneath the waves and the three young men that were riding with them clung to the, the upturned boat, to the hull. And it was so frigid, two of them eventually slid down into the lake. And Robert McKenzie, only a 14-year-old boy at that time, was the sole survivor. And the boat drifted over towards North Home and the, 
the mass stuck in the bottom of the lake some hundred yards from shore, but he managed to swim to shore and find one of the few cabins that was still around at that time. And this was the very first steamboat on Lake Minnetonka, the Governor Ramsey. It was launched by uh, Reverend Charles Galpin. Here you can see it in Excelsior. It wasn't a very uh, a reliable boat. Its machinery, the, uh, the engine, the gears were made of wood. So the cogs on that would frequently break off and the boat would be incapacitated. I mean, it was rather easy to, uh, to fix. You just took another block of wood and hammered it into the place of the old one. Uh, but its most useful implement was a big, long pole. There was no reverse gear on this boat. So what they would always pull in side, uh, broadside to the shore. And to get the boat turned around, they used that big pole to push off and point the boat in the right direction. Here you can see the boat uh, in Wyzetta. This is August 25th, 1867. And the Governor Ramsey, then called the Excelsior, uh, was meeting the very first train to Lake Minnetonka. And that was really the start of uh, a very progressive uh, steamboat transportation company around the lake. Uh, in later 1867, the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad, the, the engine that you see there, that company purchased this and renamed the boat the Lady of the Lake. Here you can see it again, uh, this would be in Excelsior again, but there's, you can kind of see the spiral staircase that comes up behind the wheelhouse. In 1872, uh, uh, Reverend Galpin died and his widow leased the boat to Orpheus S. Gates, who removed the wheelhouse and put the, the, steer, uh, the wheel down on the first deck and renamed it the Minnetonka. Uh, two years later, uh, Widow Galpin sold the boat to Charles May, who was the king of boats on Lake Minnetonka in the 1870s. And he removed all the machinery, put it into his new tugboat, the Rambler, and then just used the Governor Ramsey as a barge. Uh, this is a picture about 1905, where it laid uh, until it rotted away on the north shore of Shady Isle. Uh, we're just going through some of the very early boats. This is the May Queen. It was uh, launched, uh, it was the one, two, three, fourth steamboat ever put on Lake Minnetonka. Uh, it was over 50 feet long, and uh, to me, it was one of the prettiest steamboats on the lake. I just like the lines of it. Uh, and it was called the May Queen. It had an Ames boiler that exploded at Shady Isle in 1879. Uh, here you can see it at Wyzetta Spirit Knob in the background. Uh, after it exploded, uh, Captain May, who was the owner of it, uh, removed the machinery and uh, brought, potentially brought the entire boat and the machinery to Spirit Lake, Iowa, where he reused everything in a boat called the Ben Lennox, which was later called the Manhattan. And when that boat kind of disintegrated, all the machinery was put into the Okaboji, which still to the, this day exists on Spirit Lake. And this is the Mary. It was, it was built by the hermit of Lake Minnetonka, Frank Halstead in 1876. It was a the hermit, yes. He lived in the hermitage, uh, just on uh, between the main lake and Halstead Bay. And at first, uh, this was a complete disaster for uh, Major Frank Halstead, and uh, Captain Halstead, and uh, he ended. It was so terrible. He actually 
rode out from his home towards Crane Island, tied a bunch of rocks around himself, and threw himself over and killed himself. Uh, his brother, Major George Blight Halstead, came to settle the estate and uh, take command of the boat, and it really wasn't all that bad. The ballasting was off, and you know, after that, it was served uh, for many years on Lake, Lake Minnetonka. And for many years, uh, it gar garnered many different names, the Hiawatha, Scandinavian, the Star, the Red Star, uh, and the Star Bell of Green Lake. In 1887, it was removed from Lake Minnetonka and transferred to Green Lake. Here you can see a picture of it uh, uh, when it was called the Hiawatha. That's how it looked when it was called the Star. And then we moved to the Kate, uh, which was uh, built in 1875 uh, by Ch Captain Charles May. And it was 58 feet long, so it was a pretty good sized boat. Uh, but it also had an Ames boiler, and it blew up in 1877 and killed three people. And here you can see the same boat called the Saucy Kate. Well, it went through uh, several different names because of the explosion after, you know, before its explosion, it was known as the Kate, the Katie, the Kitty, or the Katie May. After the explosion, because it was just kind of acting up a little bit, they called it the, uh, the impudent Catherine and the saucy Kate, because they didn't like, you know, she was blowing up on them. Uh, this is in Snug Harbor in St. Albans Bay, and behind it you can see the Hattie May, which was the first stern wheel boat that was put on Lake Minnetonka in 1878, and it was also built by Captain May. Uh, in 1899, he remade that boat, and uh, it uh, was, became known as the Tonka, and that burned at its moorings uh, at Solberg Point in 1900 the year after the Saucy Kate burned. We get to the, the palace steamers, as they've been called, and this is the city of St. Louis, and it was launched by William W. Washburn. And he was president of the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad, and he was the United States Senator for Minnesota. It was uh, 160 feet long and had a beam of 48 feet. That's the beam is the distance across. And you can see uh, the top picture as it has appeared in 1881. In 1882, there was competition from a new boat, the Bell of Minnetonka, so they added another deck to it in 1882. So that's the bottom picture is how it looked for the rest of its life on Lake Minnetonka. On the wheel uh, houses, you, there were uh, murals that were painted. On one side was a mural of uh, Fort Snelling, and on the other side was a picture of Eads Bridge, the first steel bridge uh, to span the Mississippi River at St. Louis. Uh, hence the name City of St. Louis, and uh, you know, Washburn owning the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad, and you know it was also connecting to the Hotel St. Louis uh, in Deep Haven. In 1898, Captain Johnson uh, received orders from uh, the the Great Northern Railroad to decommission the boat and uh, tear it apart. He removed all the machinery, which was sold off. The back end of the, the boat was turned into a dredge scow. And this is the front of the boat here. Uh, it was turned into a party barge named the Priscilla, which lasted only until 1900 when it also burned. 
I mentioned the Bell of Minnetonka, and it was built by James J. Hill. And it was 285 feet long and had a 60-foot beam. And the, the hull of the boat was brand new. It was uh, built by Captain Davidson, Peyton Dave Davidson of La Crosse, Wisconsin, and shipped to Wyzetta. But the upper works and the engines came from the steamboat Phil Sheridan that was built in the 1860s. It was a Ohio River and Mississippi River steamboat. So that was all reused, but it was part of his grand plan to monopolize all the tourist industry of Lake Minnetonka, which you can see here. You can see his grand hotel, the Lafayette Hotel, which uh, opened in 1882, and his railroad, the Minneapolis-St. Paul and Manitoba Railroad that ran right to the front door. And then, so he got people there, he had a place to house them, but then for transportation on the lake, he had to have the biggest and best steamboat on the lake. And that's what you see here. Almost 300 feet long. And this is how it appeared in 1882. The top deck right underneath the, the wheelhouse it's called the Texas Cabin, and it had accommodations to sleep 40 people and had a dining room. And it didn't last all that long. By 1887, it was only making special runs. It may have gotten out once or twice, and by 1890, after the 1890 season, it was uh, it was floated into St. Albans Bay on the North Shore, and it was just left there to rot. And here you can see a couple girls. It became a tourist attraction in its own, where people would go out to that boat and take a look around. Here it is on the aft deck. Uh, the wheelhouse is up on top, and people would just go out and walk through the skeleton of a boat. And there it lay in St. Albans Bay until 1897 when uh, the Great Northern Railroad asked Captain Johnson to demolish it and uh, remove all the machinery. Well, he, they salvaged all the upper works and the machinery, but the hull lay in St. Albans Bay. And if you know where to look, I mean, you still might be able to find parts of it in the bottom of Lake Minnetonka, it could still be seen there into the 1930s. We move on to the street, uh, the Twin City Rapid Transit Company's plans for Lake Minnetonka, and Thomas Lowry tried to do the same thing as uh, James J. Hill to monopolize the whole lake tourist industry. He bought the Tonka Bay Hotel in 1902, 1905. He brought streetcar service to Lake Minnetonka. In 1906, he opened Big Island Amusement Park. So he had you know, transportation to the lake, a place for them to stay, an amusement on the lake. But then in 1906, he also launched uh, the streetcar service and the ferry service to Big Island Amusement Park. He launched uh, these six streetcar boats, the Harriet, the Como, uh, the Stillwater, the Minnehaha, uh, and the White Bear, and the Hopkins. Uh, and they transported people all around Lake Minnetonka. Here you can see this is about uh, 1906, uh, and uh, it shows Big Island Amusement Park, and then the red dotted lines all around the lake show where these steamboats took people. Eventually, in 1906, after dredging uh, through Cooks Bay up to Mound City, uh, there was also streetcar boat service right here into Mound. But you can see there's Zumbra Heights, and even to this day, there really isn't all that much in Zumbra Heights. But that happens to be where Calvin Goodrich had his summer home and he was president of the streetcar company, and he needed a way to get to work. And then there were the ferry boats that took people out to Big Island Amusement Park, 
And here you can see the Minneapolis on the top in Minnetonka. There were three of them that were built in 1906. And uh, originally, as they appeared, is on the top. And they were 109 feet long. But somewhere in the construction of these boats, they decided to increase the amount and weight and size of the machinery that was put in, being put into it. And it was so much heavier than what the original design was is that the boat just sank into the water danger, precariously close to the gunnels on it. And as a consequence, instead of being able to carry 1,000 to 1,200 passengers, they had to reduce it to about three to 400 people at a time that they could transport. So it was considered a miserable failure. So during the, so the winter of 1906-07, uh, they reconstructed these boats and they added uh, to the front and back of them and made it 139 feet long. At that time, the largest steamboat on Lake Minnetonka. And it was double-ended, so uh, all they had, to, they could steer straight into the docks going out to, Lake, to Big Island Amusement Park. When they were done, they just walked to the other side of the boat and shifted the transmission on the, the system to go in the opposite direction, and then they just pulled right back out. So it was rather ingenious how they did that. In 1915, they added one more streetcar boat, uh, the uh, Excelsior, which was 90 feet long instead of 75 as the original streetcar boats. One of the last uh, uh, steamboats to be built was the George, which was launched in Excelsior in 1901. And uh, it was also a rather difficult boat. You can see the top picture as it originally appeared with the wheelhouse in the center. And it was very difficult to dock the boat. The, the pilot couldn't see where it was going and they, would, they were constantly ramming into docks. And so uh, after a couple years, they moved the wheelhouse, as you can see on the bottom, to the front of the boat. And it made it much more easier to, to handle, and all that paneling on the sides, that was just a big, huge sail. And so just a little gust of wind would come along and it would blow that right across the lake and made it real difficult to steer. So they removed that all and renamed it the Excelsior. But in 1906, uh, the streetcar company was getting, you know, this was their competition. So at the end of the season, they purchased it and uh, they operated for one year only in 1907 and it just wasn't economical to run it wasn't a very well designed or adaptable boat so they just decommissioned it and in august 12 1909 they made a publicity stunt out of it they figured you know we paid I think it was thirty two hundred dollars for the boat, something like that. And they thought, well, if we take it out and burn it, we can get all kinds of people to travel on our streetcar system and pay a quarter or 15, I think it was 15 cents at that time to come out from Minneapolis. And they got over 5,000 people to come out from Minneapolis on their streetcar system to watch this boat burn. Yep. They, they would put on extra cars to the streetcars and they'd haul, they'd haul all those people out. So 5,000 times 15 cents, I don't know what the math is on that, but uh, you can see, you know, for something that was worthless to them as an organization, it could still make them some money in some way. The last steamboat on Lake Minnetonka was the, the streetcar boat Hopkins, which was sold in 19, oh, 1926 to Captain George Hopkins, which was kind of fitting, but he didn't keep the Hopkins name. He painted it white and called it the Minnetonka. 
and it remained a steamboat until 1940 when the steam component was taken out of it and it was uh, transitioned to an oil burner uh, and it remained on the lake until 1949 when it was scuttled on, out on Lake Minnetonka. And the end of steamboats on Lake Minnetonka was really rather inglorious. This is Snug Harbor in St. Albans Bay, April 1897. The, it shows the wreck of the city of Minneapolis, the Hebe, the Helena, the Acti, the Queen, the Paul Sherwin, Topsy, Nina, Alert, Florence M. Deering, and the Dagmar. And that's just, in former years, this is where boats were wintered over. Uh, but by 1897, steamboats were going out of favor. They were complex uh, pieces of machinery, and you really had to know what you were doing with them, or people died. Uh, and so Snug Harbor was eventually where steamboats came to die. And what were they re being replaced with was, this is one of them, a naphtha launch which you can see it still has a big hunk of machinery in, at the stern of the boat, but much smaller than a steam engine with its boiler and machinery. And this is all it was, you know, very com compact compared to a steam engine. And this is an advertisement for it, and it's a, it can be uh, started in three minutes as opposed to a steam boiler, it's gonna take you half an hour at least to, to get it uh, going. No government inspection, you don't need a, a pilot or an engineer for it. Uh, there's no dirt from coal or wood, there's no smoke or ashes. Uh, it's so much lighter that and smaller that there's much more room for people to sit on the boat. I saw that it was just a huge advantage to have this. Here you can see the machinery. And this is a gas tank here. It has naphtha oil in it, which uh, it vaporizes at a re relatively low temperature. So here you can see this feeds the retort over here where the burner is. And it also feeds all those coils up there. Inside the coils is this naphtha oil, which turns to a vapor at a relatively low temperature. And just like the steam, it actuates the pistons up and down. Well, the exhaust from the flames goes up through the chimney. But the exhaust, instead of with the steam engine where it's expelled, this is contained back into the machinery and it exits back down through here, through here, and then this pipe goes underneath the boat into the water. The cool water quickly condenses all this naphtha oil and the back pressure from the pistons shoots it back up into the reservoir. So, I mean, it's very economical to operate and it has dual function like that. And here you can see one on Lake Minnetonka, the Urana that was owned by Thomas Janney, uh, uh, Janney Central Hill Company. It was a, a hardware sash and door company in, in Minneapolis. And this is over on Carson's Bay in the background. You can just kind of make out the roof line of the Minnetonka Yacht Club. But there were also electric boats. You think of electric cars today. Uh, that are coming on. Well, this was also a fad over a hundred years ago. And it, uh, same thing as today, a whole bunch of batteries in a boat and they would store them along the gunwales underneath the bench seating. Uh, it was rather heavy and it wasn't real economical to run because there was no electric transmission lines on Lake Minnetonka so if you had one of these boats, you had to install your own electric plant along with it on your shoreline to recharge the batteries. And this is the Penhurst, that which was owned by William Dunwoody. And uh, it was made by the Electric Launch Company in 1899. 
but gas engine engines were really where it's at. And here you can see copies of the since gas engine. And so much smaller than a steam boiler and engine, and even smaller still than uh, one of the, the naphtha engines. Here you can see just how small it is, a little two-cylinder uh, engine in just an open boat on Lake Minnetonka. And th this is what they look like. These are just the, the open boats of Lake Minnetonka. And uh, you can see the Wabin that uh, was built in 1904 for Frank Gowan. And the, the Mazeppa, which was, what was his name? Uh, uh, Harry Barnard. It was uh, built in 1900, uh, just 21 feet long. Uh, it's, you know, they were quick, they were economical. Uh, lightweight compared to anything else, and they really put the naphtha engines and the electric engines to shame. But this is what you could get from a gas launch. Uh, this is the Dunatar. Uh, it was uh, built for John and William Nichols. They were brothers. It was built at Moore Boat Works in 1902. Uh, And, no, this isn't the. It was built for Wil Walter Keith, uh, but you can see it's an actually it's a houseboat. Uh, it's uh, the pilot house. It has and two saloons, a galley. It has a, a kitchen with an oil stove in it, two wardrobes, a toilet room, engine house. This boat slept 16 people on it. You can see the inside, you know, is, and the interiors. I mean, they were using materials like mahogany to on the inside, and the mirrors were beveled glass, uh, and it's velvet tufted cushions, and these folded out to make double beds. So you can see uh, there's six little sections there. Twelve uh, people could sleep in that, and then there were room for four hammocks that they would hung, hang above these. So 16 people slept on this boat. This is looking forward and this looking aft into the engine room uh, is quite a boat. But we get to speed boats. Uh, you get boys and their toys and the first thing they're ever going to do is see who's fastest. Uh, and the top boat is uh, the Widgeon, and it was 35 feet long, uh, built in 1902. Uh, it uh, was, at the time, one of the fastest boats on the lake. It completed the 15-mile course in one hour and 30 minutes, so 10 miles an hour. Uh, the, the one below it is the white, which was uh, made by the Globe Iron Works in 1905. It was 40 feet long with an 80 horsepower engine uh, capable of 25 miles per hour. And then the next generation was the Sandy, which was made by Romali Boat Works uh, in White Bear Lake in 1909. And this was, you know, so far and above anything else uh, that was built there on, on Lake Minnetonka at that time with a V stern on it. I mean, this was a true, what they called automobile boat. I, it had you know, a lot of the same features on there. But we get to uh, sailboats, and here you can see, uh, this is right about 1900, and it shows the sailing courses for the Minnetonka Yacht Club and the Excelsior Yacht Club. And just to show some of the different kinds of boats, this is the Volante, which was built in 1887 for Hazen Burton of Deephaven. And when this came to Lake Minnetonka, it put every other boat to shame on the lake. And it was the, the queen of sailboats on Lake Minnetonka for a few years until the arrival of the Alpha. The Alpha was built by the Hershoff 
boat uh, manufacturing company in Bristol, Rhode Island, and it was built in 1892. During that year, it hands down won every single race on the eastern seaboard that it entered, and it handily beat everybody that was there. Uh, at the end of the season, Ed Edmund J. Phelps purchased the boat and brought it to Lake Minnetonka so that he could win everything here. Well, William Dunwoody and William Pete got together and they decided they weren't going to let that happen. So they had the Hirschhoff uh, Manufacturing Company build them this boat, the Kite, in 1893. And they brought that to Lake Minnetonka with the express purpose of defeating the Alpha. Well, it didn't fare so well. It didn't beat the Alpha, but it wasn't the... The Alpha didn't do so well either. In 1893, this boat, the Onawa, was launched. It was built for, uh, for Ward Burton by Arthur Dyer in Deephaven. And this absolutely revolutionized the, the 23 foot class uh, of sailing. Not only here, but on the East Coast where it had been dying out. This boat handily beat both the kite and the Alpha that year. To, and it beat them so badly that the Minnetonka Yacht Club changed all its rules to essentially ban the Onawa from sailing in their reg regattas ever again because it beat them so badly. Uh, it, it would really revolutionize sailing. Uh, it was kind of a new class of boat. It was flat bottomed and this is the grandfather of the modern scow. It's not technically a scow as it, as it looks here, uh, but this is what developed into the scow boats within just uh, less than a decade from this photo. Uh, the Onawa, uh, it still exists. It uh, is in the, the Museum of the Excelsior Lake Minnetonka Historical Society. And this is my favorite picture of all the boats. This is the hoodlum. And uh, it was built in 1898 uh, for Ward Burton. And he brought that via uh, Lake Michigan where it won its first races and then won the inner lake uh, uh, yachting regatta uh, between uh, just, uh, all the Mis Wisconsin yacht clubs and White Bear and Minnetonka. Uh, this just, it beat them all. And I love this picture because it has so much canvas on it. You'd think that with just a good breeze, this boat would just take off into the air and sail off into the sunset. It's just incredible that that, you know, it looks like a 30 foot bowsprit on that. And then there were other tiny little boats too. And here you can see the commons in Excelsior. And you see there's two little side wheel uh, boats, the Pinafore and the Bell of the Lake. They called these novelty side wheelers. And uh, they are akin to the paddle wheel boats that we uh, you know, all know today where you sit down in it and you pedal it like a recumbent bicycle. Well, here they are. Uh, again, and you can see on these, uh, they're kind of similar, but these are hand cranks. So you got, and they were chartered, so it came with their own man, and you got in there, and he took you around to wherever you want to go. But he would sit in there, and he would crank the boat like this to get you where you were going. Well, let's move to the, the upper lake. And how do you get there? Well, this is uh, 1892. And you can see over here, it says old channel. That hulls narrows. But up here, new channel. And that's the, the narrows that we know today. This is hulls narrows. 
uh, about 1879, and it was more or less a swamp with a little creek that went through it, and it wasn't until 1876 that they started to dredge this and make it, you know, accommodation for anything larger than a rowboat to get through. And it was really just a swamp, and they would come through here, and as soon as those you know, the bigger boats, the, especially the paddle wheel boats, started going through this. Uh, as soon as, you know, that paddle would start churning things up, the, the loose silt and everything from the sides would just slip right back down in, and it was a constant battle to, to keep that channel clear. They went so far as to uh, put cribbing in, and they put pilings down just flat boards to try and keep the silt out. But even with that, the cracks in the boards, the small cracks, that silt would just come right through that. It's like it didn't matter. And it, those boards were you know, just an impediment to the steamboats anyway. You get the, the paddle wheel boats in there, and a breeze would come along and move it just a little bit one away, and they were always cracking up their paddles on that. So. It had to go. In 1884, the Hennepin County Commissioners commissioned uh, Frank and Benton Carmen uh, to dredge the new uh, narrows that we know today. This is 1884. They dredged it 75 feet wi uh, wide and seven foot deep. In 1885, they increased that to 90 feet. But just a huge amount of machinery. It was, I think, $12,000 in 1880, from 1882 to the spring of 80, 1884 that they expended in building this piece of machinery. So that's a huge amount of money in the 1880s. In 1889, the county commissioners decided we're going to make a road that connects uh, Excelsior to Navarre. At, before that time, there was no, there was no road there. Uh, but to get there, you still had to cross the Narrows. And so in 1889, uh, they commissioned this ferry boat to be built. And it operated crossing the Narrows from 1889 to 1910 until the first bridge was uh, built in, there in 1911. Didn't always go real well. Uh, this is Gebhardt Bones' car from Bones Point in Crystal Bay, and it just, somebody probably forgot to set the emergency brake or something, and it just rolled off the back of the 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 car ferry. Uh, <laughs> this would be you know right about 1909. And this is the Sioux Gardeneer. It was, it's an upper lake boat. And uh, uh, it was launched on Lake Minnetonka in 1871. So it was the second steamboat on Lake Minnetonka. Uh, eventually it was uh, removed from Lake Minnetonka I think it went to uh, the Mississippi River and uh, wound up by, down by Red Wing and just rotting there. But th this shuttled people you know, all around the lake, but uh, onto Lake Minnetonka. And this is the 76. It was uh, built in 1876 uh, for James J. Hill's Northwestern Fuel Company. Uh, that year, there was a new sawmill that was developed in Mound City, and uh, there was a lot of lumbering that was going on in this area. So the, the 76 was used as a tugboat, and you can see a barge here. They would load that with logs, take it through the Narrows over to Wyzetta, and that's where the James J. Hill had his St. Paul and Pacific, at that time, the uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul and Manitoba Railroad. And they would load the logs and lumber onto that, and then they'd transport it to where all the people were in Minneapolis and St. Paul uh, 
for fuel or to be cut into lumber. In 1883, uh, the lumbering was pretty much done and they sold the boat to uh, Harry Lilliger, who named it, renamed it for his uh, daughter, Katie Lilliger. Uh, yes. And here you can see one of the, the first charter boats of the Upper Lake, the Bell of Mound City. And it was built in 1878 by Ed Bartlett of the Bartlett Hotel, Bartlett Place. And here you can see it in front of their home. This was a charter boat. This is how people traveled. It wasn't uh, just a pleasure a vehicle. You know, this is how people got to the hotel on the Upper Lake or other places around the lake. It would hold up to 14 people at a time. And it was still operating in 1880. And that little house developed into this, the Bartlett Hotel. Another upper boat steamboat, upper lake steamboat, the Florence M. Deering. Uh, it was built by uh, Royal Moore in Wyzetta for Charles W. Deering who lived at the mouth of West Arm uh, and uh, West Arm Bay and it was built in 1890 and it was used for uh, the accommodation of people of West Arm uh, Bay and Saga Hill and people in that area and it was simply a way to get to and from their lake homes so this was a commercial venture of Charles M. Deering uh, he operated the boat until 1909 and he sold it to Frank Mann who had his uh, headquarters over at Edgewood on the south shore of Lake Minnetonka and he renamed it the Iwana. Iwana? Iwana. <laughs> and uh, uh, he sold it in about 1915 to Joseph de Guise, who renamed it the Little Joe, and it was removed in, from Lake Minnetonka in 1919. <clears throat> now, one of the big attractions on Lake Minnetonka was the Chapman House. And you can see it here about uh, 1880, 1879, 1880. And it was built by two brothers, and they had built a big dining room that could seat uh, 300 people at a time. In that house? Yeah, for, for this uh, hotel, they had a dining room that could seat 300 people at a time. Now, you couldn't put 300 people in this hotel at one time. It just simply was not that large. But... This is what was coming to the Chapman House. Here in the foreground, uh, in the background, along the shore, you can see the city of St. Louis, which could hold up to 1,500 people at a time. And the Bell of Minnetonka, where, from where this picture is taken, could take 2,500 people at a time. All these people, they were going to the, the farthest end of the lake that these boats could reach, and that was the Chapman House. It was really, at that time, the only hotel on the Upper Lake, or only hotel of any size or repute. So uh, you can see over on the right side up here, the Chapman House up on the hill. It's, a, it's actually a fairly substantial structure. But here's the Bell of Minnetonka coming into the dock at the Chapman House. And you can see the pathway here that goes up the hill to the Chapman House. And getting off of that boat, well, I'm not sure I would even want to do it. They simply took a couple planks, put them on the bow, and then plopped them down onto this skinny little dock. And there's no, there's no ropes, there's no handrails or anything. You just walked on, on down. But here you can see the 58-foot Saucy Kate 
next to the Bell of Minnetonka, and you get just an idea of how enormous that boat was. Almost 300 feet long. But times have changed, and uh, here we get two boats, the, the West Arm and the Golden Rule. They were owned by Gus Nelson. They were upper boat lakes, and uh, they were launched at Woodland Point and operated by his son, Elwood Nelson, uh, as a boat livery service. So uh, he would be you know, transporting people, packages, you know, anything. It was the UPS and bus service of its day. Uh, and uh, it was uh, based in Spring Park, but it was still operating as late as 1922. Here's a picture of the Venus, another gas launch. Uh, it was built about 1905, and it was uh, operated as part of the Phelps Island Ferry Company. Uh, and it served, it was based in Spring Park uh, and served the docks of Avalon and Pembroke and Devon on Phelps Island at least through 1914. And there, there really weren't all that many boats that were connected directly with the upper lake. Uh, the boats of Lake Minnetonka, uh, you know, I'm guessing maybe 15, 20% of them were upper lake boats. So uh, there just weren't as many, but some of the private boats, uh, well, this is another one of those commercial boats, uh, the Edgewood, it was originally called the Woodland that was operated by Jack Knowlton. It was another one of those parcel delivery and bus services that uh, traveled the upper lake. It was. Uh, based in Edgewood. But uh, this one is the Winnelora, and it was built by Moore Boat Works in 1902 for Frederick Norenberg, uh, named after his daughters Winnie and Laura. Uh, and uh, it was 48 feet long, and a three quarter cabin, full cabin boat. And the, the Kanahauke, which was built by Moore Boat Works for Albert Loring in 1901. And he had his estate, you know, over where uh, the Hermitage was in Minnetrista. Uh, but you can see on the inside, uh, the windows, they it can be fully enclosed, but those windows drop down into the gunnels so that it completely opens up the boat. And mo many of these boats had no permanent seating. So you, I, most of the pictures I see, they get wicker chairs and they just set them up. Well, it's not such a big deal when you're only going 10 miles an hour in one of these boats when that's full throttle. And this is the Shawanda Sea. And that was, uh, built in 1903 for Calvin Goodrich, and he had his home over at Zumbra Heights. And this boat saw years and years of service. Uh, what was it? It was uh, renamed the Mohawk uh, by 1940, and it was still operating on Lake Minnetonka into the 1950s. And uh, the Winnow Jean, was uh, built by Moore Boat Works in 1901 for Horace Gates. He had a summer home on, on Casco Point. And the Billy Dee, uh, built in 1902 or 1903 for uh, William Dave Davidson, who also had a home on Casco Point, uh, which was a St. Paul enclave. Here's the, the Fitz P, uh, also a, a Spring Park boat built in 1901. 
and the Sierra Nevada, uh, which was uh, built in 1906 by Moore Boat Works for uh, Edmund Longyear. And he had his uh, place uh, at Rose Farm on Smithtown Bay. And in this boat, we have the Lorena and the Geneva. And they were uh, built for Edward Beiss. Beiss? I, I don't know if anyone knows the correct uh, pronunciation for that. But he had his home on the, the west end of Halstead Bay. And uh, the Geneva was, so, was small enough and uh, one of his granddaughters told me that it was really just a glorified rowboat with a motor in it. But in 1906, uh, right about the time that these boats were, were made, uh, John Johnson was uh, authorized by the Hennepin County Commissioners to dredge a 30-foot channel all the way from Halstead Bay to St. Bonnie. And they could take this, the Geneva all the way into St. Bonnie to, to get groceries or whatever they needed in there. So uh, six miles. And this is uh, the Eagle Island. Uh, I've only known this boat uh, to be on the lake in 1907. Don't know who made it, although it's probably Roy Moore because it has a torpedo stern on it. Uh, and it's a three-quarter cabin boat. Uh, and this caused quite a kerfuffle on Lake Minnetonka. Uh, and arrests were made. Uh, while the boat was moored in mound, a couple men stole the boat and no one really figured out exactly what they were doing and i don't think they really figured out what they were doing either because they didn't know after they stole it they didn't know what to do with it how you get rid of it you can't really get it off the lake and sell it without people really knowing so they drilled holes in the bottom of the boat and they scuttled it but the the canvas top on the aft part it up so they scooped that up and they took it behind their barn and they burned it but it's fireproof so it didn't burn very well and the cops came and they found it and knew what it was from and so they got arrested so just a little bit of uh, antics on the north on the upper lake of Lake Minnetonka that in concludes uh, my presentation, and if you have some questions, I'll be glad to try and answer them.